unfortunately, regular expressions are not powerful enough to represent the type of things that we want to be able to represent for whole programs. So we normally have another phase which uh, looks at other things. So the type of things that I that, that regular expressions can't do is regular expressions cannot count to arbitrary depths. Ha they have no memory per se. So, for example, it can't. You can't write a regular expression that enables you to match parentheses. Okay. So it can't count how deep you are in a stack of, parent of parenthesized operations and then pop off those as it comes out the other end and tell you that you've matched, right? Which is very upsetting because those are typically required to be able to work out what's going on inside your compiler. Uh, it also can't easily deal with operator precedents and lots of other things it can't deal with. So regular expressions are normally just used for the lexical phase. We need something more complicated for the following phases. And normally what we use is a context-free grammar, okay? Mm -hmm. Do you know what a context-free grammar is? No. Okay. Do you, do you actually know? Do you, do you know? <laughs> go, yeah. on, go on, tell us what a context-free grammar is. No, I have a very extremely vague idea about how, what it is. Okay, so well, so basically they are um, a set of uh, rules like this, which uh, like these guys down here, which I've written in BNF, which is uh, Bacchus Nor form. Actually, these aren't exactly in Bacchus Nor form, because I think the arrow here is not what they have in Bacchus Nor form. Anyway, it's close enough, right? Um, so these are grammar rules, which tell me that, an ex in this one, it tells me that an expression here uh, is made up of a term, oops, hold on, uh, a term, uh, which is, you'll see is written down here, which is another non-terminal, uh, an operator non-terminal, an expression, or it could be this instead. So it's either this thing here, or it's this thing here, Okay. And a term is either a number or an identifier. There's a number, there's an identifier, uh, which we've got from our lexa, from our scanner, which are the tokens. Um, and these are terminals in this case. Or it's an operator with these uh, tokens from the scanner. Okay? Mm -hmm. Right, now, uh, we're asking, I was asking what a context-free one is. The thing about a context-free one is that the thing over on this side only has one non-terminal. Let's get rid of all that rubbish. All right. Only has one non-terminal. Okay? A context, non-context-free grammar has uh, more than one non-terminal or terminals and non-terminals on that side. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this restriction um, means that there are some languages we cannot express, but it turns out we don't tend to use those very often. There are no, no examples in real, that I can think of anyway, in real computer languages where we need context sensitivity. Context sensitive grammars are much more, uh, much more powerful, but it turns out that it's very hard to match, uh, to, to parse a context sensitive grammar, and it's very easy to parse a context free grammar. So that's why we use them. Okay. It is very easy when you are writing these grammars to have ambiguity, uh, which means that there are multiple ways to parse the same sentence. Okay, uh, generators like Yak, Bison, and Antler will um, will complain at you if you write an ambiguous grammar, uh, and will say that you can't have this grammar in your thing. Okay, all right. So, uh, Pavlos, can you parse for me this guy down here? All right, so we've got a little, got a little statement, x minus 2 times y. How does that parse through this uh, grammar that we've got here? Okay, so uh, we start with the top level, I guess. Yep. So this is an expression. Yep. Or we assume it's an expression. We hope it's an expression. <laughs> and uh, so it can either be a term or expression okay or term op term yeah uh, it cannot be term op term because uh, we have more things than that cannot be term op term no oh well okay wait wait hold on what do you mean so so you're going for this rule for this production these are called productions by the way yeah. this is sorry this is called a rule right uh, and this is called the left hand side this is called the right hand side and the right hand side is uh, made up of two productions. This is either this or this, right? So you're okay. going for that production. Okay, so it's not the term. Uh, oh, so it's not. It's not. It's not this one. 
it's our turn because uh, the time is supposed to be either a number or an ID, and what you're passing is more than that. Yeah. So it has to be, if it's something, if it's valid, it has to be a term op expression. Yeah. Uh, so you mean, so what you could do hmm? is you could say, you could assume, it, say, say, we, say we assumed it was this one, right? You'd go down here. And yeah, that's a terrible line. Uh, you'd go down here and you'd say, all right, uh, it's a term, so it's either a number or an ID. We've got an ID. And then you'd go, oh, I've still got more more content over here. And that would yeah. then fail, right? Okay, so you, you could try that route, and then you'd end up backtracking yeah. to try this one. So we try this one. So term of expression. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we know. So now term. you now you match the term. Yeah, term must be a number or an ID. So you match that and make that an ID. So uh, X matches the ID rule. Yep. Uh, so we say X is ID. Yep. Uh, so uh, going back to the initial uh, rule. Yeah. Uh, minus has to be an op. Yeah. So we get an op, which uh, we then try to match here, and we get minus. And we see that minus is an op. Yep. Uh, so two times y must be an expression. Yeah. So. Uh, so it comes back to to this guy. So recursively again we check the two times y. Okay, we're not going to get this one. That again, we, that was going to fail. Again, it's not no term. So try this one. Yeah, uh, two is uh, a term because it's a number. Yeah. Uh, the asterisk is an op. Yeah. And y is. Uh, Ah, it's an expression. It's an expression. Yes, yes, yes. Good notice there, right? Because we have to go back and ex and do this, right? So now we're coming back to do this expression, and what do we get? And then this. So one... y is an expression. Doesn't match the first rule, but it does match the second, which says it's a term, because uh, x is an ID. Yeah. Okay. So we have managed to match this thing. We've had to backtrack a couple of times when we went down a rule and it turned out to be the wrong thing, but we came up with the right answer. Uh -huh. Great. Okay. Right, so it should look like this, Pavlos. Did your in your head? Did it look like that? No. No, oh, did it not? What did it look like? <laughs> Similar. <laughs> okay, so uh, here's the parse tree for this expression. Uh, we started with an expression. We had a term on this guy. This is this this branch here, and then we had the minus operator there. Okay. Oh, I don't like it. Wait, does that? Hold on. Give me one second. I'm just going to change some settings on here. Yeah. There we go. Um, and then we did uh, 2 times y with this expression tree, this subtree here, which we had uh, 2 down there, the operator, and then we had another expression down there representing all that kind of stuff. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Make sense? All right, so that's all well and good. Uh, what would happen if we had this statement down here? Oop, this guy down here. So notice that this is passed... Okay, and by the way, I'll give you a, I'll give you a hint, Pablos. Um, this one is parsed correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, would this one be parsed correctly? Would it get the if we've got x times two minus y, would it be parsed like this? It would be parsed, but uh, not in the way we would like to. Let's have a look, shall we? So we've got x times. Oh, and we can add some text in here, can't we? Uh, let's add some text. Uh, x times 2 minus y. Is that what we had? That's what we're looking for, right? Yeah. Okay, so there we go. So we're going to look for that, right? So what happens here? So, uh, again, it matches the first rule. Yeah. So uh, we go for the term matches x. x uh, is the term. Uh, the asterisk is op. Yeah. And uh, 2 minus y is another expression. Yeah. Disaster! What's happened there? That's not right. That means that we're going to end up matching it like this. We're going to end up with x times 2 minus y. That's no good, is it? No. Oh, Pavlos, who wrote this grammar? <laughs> that guy was an idiot. <laughs> okay. Is it yours? Uh, yes, but I sort of came out with it for a reason to show that um, you uh, need to make some changes if you want for things to be uh, parsed correctly. And in your compiling techniques, you will have seen how to write this stuff in a way that will, um, you, you have some extra bits in here, you usually have a fact term, which enables you to get your, uh, your parsing in the right way. Okay? Mm -hmm. And in fact, you sometimes have lots of different terms depending on the, uh, what's it called? What's the precedence of the different bits. Okay? Great. Great. All right. So there you go. So we saw that. 
And then uh, we've now got a syntax tree over here, which uh, is great. But it turns out that this sometimes have lots of redundant information in it. Like, we don't really care that this, like, you see this bit here, that's kind of redundant once you've got this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what we'd kind of like to do is kind of bubble this stuff up so that we get rid of these artifacts from the parsing process to just leave us with, you know, if I'd asked you to parse this yourself without coming up with a with a with that grammar, you'd have thought of something like this, right? A binary expression with x on one side, uh, with a minus there, a binary expression with times, and a 2 and a y there, right? Mm -hmm. So this phase here uh, is, uh, is done sometimes to simplify the AST to make it easier to reason about and to get close to what it is that we had in mind when we were, we were writing this, this thing. Okay, so this is more normally what people uh, expect the uh, the front end to come up with uh, when it's done its job. Okay? And that's normally what we deal with for our abstract syntax tree. Okay? Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Whew! Semantic analysis. All right, so we've done our syntactic analysis, which builds the abstract syntax tree. So we are now going to move on to semantic analysis, which works out whether our uh, syntax tree means what it's supposed to mean, whether, whether it matches our rules and does all the right things, right? Mm -hmm. Whether the types are right, uh, whether we have used variables in the right places and things like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, this is <laughs> good. Cool. Thank you for that. Uh, it's good. To see, I told you I was going to put in mistakes just to see whether you were awake. Um, it's a good job that you had your coffee earlier. Uh, okay. So um, yes, yeah, still on semant on syntactic analysis. Um, yes, beg your pardon. It turns out that uh, parsing arbitrary context-free grammars can be quite expensive. It's also quite easy to write a context-free uh, a thing that will parse arbitrary context-free grammars uh, by dynamic programming. It's quite straightforward, uh, and it will catch lots. So it's quite useful as well sometimes because it will. And by by writing a dynamic context-free grammar parser, you can do things like say, if there's an error, what's the smallest distance I can have to match it up? But we'll ignore that for the moment. The point is, it's expensive, on the order of uh, n cubed. Which, if you imagine that. Uh, as you write longer programs, you might have to wait weeks for them to parse uh, just to compile. Then that would be rather upsetting. So it turns out that what we what people have done is they've restricted the types of grammars that are allowed to go into the compiler uh, to a set of things that are easier to parse instead. Okay, and we have a set of different classes of these grammars which are parsed by different tools uh, and have different properties. Okay, so some of the more famous ones are LR, and they have a number usually here, which tells me how many symbols of look-ahead we're allowed to have in the grammar so that it can decide what it's doing. Okay, So LR is scan from left to right. So normally we always scan from left to right because most compiler languages, most languages go left to right. Uh, and derive from the rightmost bit first. Okay, Which means when we were looking at that... Uh, Parse, but looking at that grammar first, once you've chosen a production, you would basically go through the thing and sort of do it from the right bit first, okay? Uh, with one similar look at. So that's LR1. Uh, LL1 is uh, a left to right scan, uh, doing the leftmost first with one symbol of look ahead, okay? Now, this one cannot handle left recursive grammars. I can't remember whether the one we had up here was left recursive or not. Uh, it's not left recursive. This one is right recursive because this is on the right hand side. If the if this were expert here, uh, then LL uh, one would fall over because it doesn't know how to get past these uh, left recursions. And we have lots of other different types of things that are used. Uh, one of the most common you'll find in l most compiler things is LALR, K, uh, and we have lots of different types in here. I think that Antler, which is quite a modern compiler generator is LL star, which means it has essentially infinite look ahead. Uh, and we have all sorts of different things like this. Some of them actually represent the same class of languages, um, but they have different properties. Things like this. You're looking confused? That's fine. It's not terribly important for this course because we're actually doing compiler optimization. This is just a reminder that these are things you should have remembered from when you were doing your, your reading yeah, your books. It wasn't like being bored. It was like, uh, more like, do I care? <laughs> You don't care. It's fine. It, okay. It sounds exactly like the kind of information I won't have to remember ever again. That's that. Uh, I've just realised that that's the look you have on your face mostly when I'm talking to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay. 
So, um, so that is uh, just to round off our syntactic analysis, just to tell you that there are these different different forms of the things. And when you decide to use a uh, parser generator, you should check what type of parser generator, it, what type of languages it can uh, understand before you go through it, because it will change how you write your rules. As noted, if it's LL, then you can't write left recursion, and you need to modify your rules in order to stop it doing left recursion. Okay.